In this video, we're going to be doing a couple practice problems involving transforming functions. Let's jump right in. Let's start off by just doing a quick recap of transformations. If you have some function f of x and you define g of x to be f of x plus c, then g of x is just f of x shifted in the vertical direction. And the direction of the shift, so whether it's up or down, depends on the sign of c, whether it's positive or negative. Now, if you define g of x to be f of x minus c, then g of x is f of x shifted in the horizontal direction. Once again, the direction of the shift, so right or left, depends on the sign of c. Vertical and horizontal shifts are collectively known as translations, and translations are a type of transformation that result in the change in position of a graph on the xy plane. Now let's move on to a second type of transformation, reflections. If g of x is defined as negative f of x, then g of x is f of x reflected over the x-axis. And if g of x is defined as f of negative x, then g of x is f of x reflected over the y-axis. In general, reflections cause changes in the orientation of a graph. So for example, if you reflect the parabola y is equal to x squared over the x-axis, the parabola opens downward instead of upward. And so that would be an example of a change in orientation. Now the final way you can transform a function is by stretching or shrinking it. If you define g of x to be some constant c times f of x, then that's a stretch or shrink in the vertical direction, depending on the magnitude of c. And if you have g of x is equal to f of c times x, then that's a horizontal stretch or shrink, once again, depending on the magnitude of c. Now, if you want a more in-depth explanation about each of these transformations, then check out the previous two videos in this course. I'll have the playlist for the course linked in the top right of the screen right now. But in this video, we're going to focus on what happens when we apply these transformations simultaneously. Let's say we have a function g of x, which is defined as being some constant a times f of some constant b times x minus h plus k. You can think of this function, g of x, as being these six individual transformations fused together. Now, if we do a little bit of pattern matching, we can see that this plus k resembles this first case right here, and so k is going to be responsible for vertical shifts. This x minus h resembles this case, and so x minus h is going to be responsible for horizontal shifts. Now we're multiplying the x minus h term by a constant b, and that resembles this last case, and so b is going to be responsible for horizontal stretches and shrinks. And finally, we have a. We're multiplying a by the output of the function f of x, so that resembles this case, and so a is going to be responsible for vertical stretches and shrinks. And whether or not our function is being reflected over the x-axis or y-axis depends on the signs of a and b. If a is negative, like it is in this case, then we're reflecting over the x-axis. And if b is negative, like it is in this case, then we're reflecting over the y-axis. Now let's put all this to use and actually graph some functions. All right, so here's our first example. We have the function g of x is equal to negative 3 times x minus 2 whole squared plus 1. And just for reference, I've also copied over the general form of a transform function. So the first thing I like to do when looking at these sets of problems is identify what type of function we're working with. I see the squared on the x term, so I know it's going to be some sort of parabola. So let's start off by graphing the parent function for parabolas, that is f of x is equal to x squared, and then to that parent function, we'll apply these transformations one by one until we end up with g of x. All right, so let's start with the parent function f of x is equal to x squared, which we know looks something like this. Now, let's incorporate this negative sign. So let's say we have a function g1 of x, which is negative x squared. Now, g1 of x is just negative f of x, because f of x is x squared, and so negative f of x is negative x squared. And if you remember from the previous slide, if you have a function that is equal to negative f of x, then that function is just f of x reflected over the x-axis. So g1 of x is going to look roughly like this. Now let's add in this 3. And as you can see here, we're integrating each of these individual transformations one by one. So now say we have a function g2 of x, which is equal to negative 3x squared. g2 of x is nothing but negative 3 times f of x. Now this negative sign means that g2 of x is going to be f of x 
flipped over the x-axis. We've already accounted for that in our second graph. But what does the 3 mean? Well, since we're multiplying f of x by some constant, it's going to be a vertical stretch or shrink, and since that constant has a magnitude greater than 1, its magnitude is 3, g2 of x is going to be f of x, not only flipped over the x-axis, but also stretched in the vertical direction. And so g2 of x is going to look something like this. Okay, now let's add in this x minus 2 instead of just x. So say we have a function g3 of x is equal to negative 3 x minus 2 whole squared. Now if you want to write g3 of x in terms of f of x, then all it is is negative 3 times f of x minus 2. We've already accounted for the negative 3 in these first two steps, so now let's think about what the x minus 2 does. We know from our general form that this x minus h term causes horizontal shifts, and since we have x minus 2, g3 of x is going to be g2 of x shifted two units to the right. And so if this is x is equal to 2, then g of x is going to look something like this. Now the last thing we need to account for is this plus 1, and then we'll have g of x. So if you want to write g of x in terms of f of x, it's negative 3 f of x minus 2 plus 1. We've accounted for the negative 3 and the x minus 2 already, and so now let's focus on the plus 1. If you remember from the previous slide, adding a constant to a function causes a vertical shift. In this case, we're adding 1, so g of x is going to be g3 of x shifted one unit up. And so if this is 2 and this is 1, then g of x looks something like that, where its vertex is at the point 2, 1. And so just to review each of these steps, we have f of x is equal to x squared, then we reflected that function over the x-axis, then we stretched it vertically by a factor of 3, shifted it to the right by 2 units, and then shifted it up 1 unit, and then we ended up with g of x. And so, as you can see, you can break down the graphing of these functions into their individual transformations and make it a step-by-step -step process. Now let's move on to the second example. Alright, so here's our second example. We have g of x is equal to negative the square root of negative 2x plus 2. So right off the bat, we can see that g of x is a square root function, and so its parent function, which we can call f of x, is going to be the square root of x. So a series of transformations have been applied to turn f of x into g of x, and we'll walk through each of those steps right now. First off, let's just graph what f of x looks like. The square root function looks like this. The first individual transformation we're going to take a look at is the one caused by this negative sign right here. So let's say we have a function g1 of x, which is equal to negative square root of x. All g1 of x is is negative f of x. And since g1 of x is negative f of x, g1 of x is going to be f of x reflected over the x-axis. And so it's going to look something like this. Now the next thing we're going to account for is this negative sign right here. So let's say we have a function g2 of x, which is negative the square root of negative x. And so g2 of x can be rewritten as negative f of negative x. Now we've already accounted for this negative sign. This negative sign reflected f of x over the x-axis. So now let's think about what this negative sign does. If you recall, if you have g of x is equal to f of negative x, then g of x is f of x reflected over the y-axis. So if g2 of x is negative f of negative x, then it's going to be f of x reflected over the x-axis, which is what we have in the second graph, and then that graph reflected over the y-axis. So g2 of x is going to look something like this. Now let's account for this too. So let's say we have a function g3 of x, which is equal to negative root negative 2x. Right, so this can be rewritten as negative f of negative 2x. So g3 of x is just g2 of x with this added 2. Now this 2 is essentially b in our general form, and so it's going to be responsible for horizontal stretches and shrinks. Now since b has a magnitude that is greater than 1, its magnitude is 2, we're going to have a horizontal compression or shrink here. And so g3 of x is going to look something like this. So it's essentially g2 of x, but compressed by a factor of 2. Alright, now let's consider the final step. 
The last thing we have to account for is this plus 2. If you want to write g of x in terms of f of x, then it is negative f of negative 2x plus 2. And your first instinct might be, well, this is a horizontal shift, and since it's plus 2, it must be 2 units to the left, since for horizontal shifts, the direction of the shift and the sign are opposite. To understand what's really going on, let's match up this notation with our general form. So a is negative 1 times f of some input, we'll come back to this, plus k. There's no k term here, so k is just 0. And now let's think about what the input for f of x is. In the general form, we have b times x minus h, but here we have negative 2x plus 2. So we're going to have to factor out a constant that is b, and from this step, we know that that constant is negative 2. And so we bring out the negative 2, and we have to multiply negative 2 by something to get negative 2x plus 2, and that something is x minus 1, because negative 2 times x minus 1 is negative 2x plus 2. And so these two are the exact same, but if we write it the way we did on the top, it becomes more clear that the horizontal shift is one unit to the right, since we have x minus 1. And so g of x will be g3 of x shifted one unit to the right, and so if this is x equals 1, then g of x looks something like this. And so just to recap, this negative sign caused us to flip f of x over the x-axis, and then because of this negative sign, we flip that flip function over the y-axis. This negative 2 caused a horizontal compression, and then this plus 2 ultimately caused a shift one unit to the right. And so in the end, g of x looks like this. And so just like in the last example, we were able to break up the process of graphing this function into multiple steps, where we isolate each of the individual transformations. And just one last piece of advice as to how you should break up these functions into multiple steps. You usually want to start off with the reflections and the vertical and horizontal stretches and shrinks, and then you can leave the translations for the end. Alright, so that about wraps it up for this video. If it did help you out at all, please be sure to leave a like, and if you want to be notified when I post the rest of the videos in this course, make sure to subscribe. Thanks for watching.